Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this InChip uh, seminar. And uh, so, my name is Xiaomei Kong. I'm the uh, Associate Dean for Research and Professor at UConn School of Nursing. And uh, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Vincent Glimmer Ramos. And his presentation topic is developing efficacious parent based interventions to reduce adolescent sexual and reproductive health disparity. Uh, so, let me introduce our speakers first. So, Dr. Vincent Glimmer Ramos uh, is Dean and Professor at UConn School of Nursing and also Vice Chancellor for Nursing Affairs at uh, Duke University. He is the founding director of the Center for Latino Adolescence and Family Health at Duke University. Uh, he is nurse practitioner, uh, duly licensed in primary care and uh, psychiatric mental health nursing. And he is also credentialed as an HIV specialist by the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Widely regarded as an expert in adolescent and young adult sexual and reproductive health promotion, his research has been funded excellently for two decades by the NIH, CDC, HRSA, and uh, other federal agencies. His research focuses on the role of families in promoting adolescence and young adult health among Latinos and in other underserved communities, with a special focus on preventing HIV AIDS, sexually transmitted infections, and improve uh, care, um, health care uh, outcomes for young uh, youth receiving HIV prevention and care services. Uh, he has published extensively in leading scientific journals and his research and scholarship has led to widespread coverage in well-known media sources. Uh, Dr. Glimo Ramos currently serves uh, as a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, the HS Panel uh, on Antiviral uh, Viral Guideline for Adults and Adolescents, the, uh, the CDC HRSA Advisory Committee on HIV, and also uh, viral uh, uh, hepatitis and STD prevention and treatment. He also served on the Latino Commission on AIDS Board of Trust, uh, Directors, the Power to Decide Board of Directors, and the Ending the HIV Epidemic Work Group of the HIV Medicine Association. So welcome, Dr. Galimo Ramos, your turn. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Kong. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to start by saying uh, that I really am looking forward to the time that we're going to have uh, today together to talk about uh, family-based interventions. I'm going to do a couple of things in my presentation, provide some examples, but I'm also going to lay out some of the conceptual uh, kind of thinking and methodological ways that I think about the development of uh, family-based interventions. Uh, before I start, uh, thanks to InShip and to all the folks that uh, work to pull this together. It takes a, a team to make uh, the webinar a success, and so I just want to say thank you in advance for everyone being here today and for all the folks that have contributed to this being a success. Um, as I mentioned, there are actually a couple of things I want to get accomplished. On the slide, you can see um, kind of the four major topics that I'm going to be covering. So the first is I've committed my career uh, to really supporting young people, adolescents and young adults. And so I want to talk about why I am so deeply committed to uh, adolescents and young adults and make a case for the importance of adolescents, irrespective of whether or not any of us are working with adolescents, why I think they're so important for all of us. Uh, I'm then going to pivot to family-based interventions and make a case for uh, why the family plays a particularly important role in shaping adolescent sexual and reproductive health. And I would extend that and even go one step further and say that actually family-based approaches and parents in particular are important for adolescent health uh, broadly. And I think that they've tended to be underutilized. And so I'm, I'm characterizing them as being a novel approach 
Uh, and I think really, I would say that they should be more utilized, but they have tended to be underutilized. And then I'm going to kind of pivot to some of the conceptual and methodological underpinnings of how do you develop an efficacious parent based intervention? And as I think about my career over the past 20 years, most of my work has focused on sexual and reproductive health. But about, I guess, 18, uh, 20 months ago, I started to work uh, within uh, sort of the global pandemic of COVID. And in New York City, uh, I started working uh, around family based approaches to intervening around COVID, particularly mitigation, testing, and vaccine uptake. And so, again, these same principles uh, apply to a number of areas. And so while my topic today is focused on sexual and reproductive health, I hope that some of what I'm going to be sharing will be useful for folks that might be participating that actually are not directly involved in SRH, but are thinking about what really matters to them in their respective programs of research. I think families are an important area and opportunity for us to actually make significant uh, progress in reducing disparities. And then uh, I'm going to sort of uh, provide an applied example using families talking together, which is the intervention that I probably uh, have spent the bulk of my uh, scientific life on. I think I've spent about 20 years on FTT, and it continues to be a place uh, for scientific growth and also of great joy, uh, as I've seen FTT have uh, sort of a big impact in the world. So I'm going to jump right in, and I'm going to probably share a couple of things that folks are aware of, but I think that it's worth kind of uh, just reviewing briefly. And so I think what this slide is de depicting is that we've got roughly 1.3 billion uh, young people ages 10 to 19 across the globe. And so a significant proportion of the world's population. And I think that you can see what's highlighted on the map. There are some places where the adolescent and young adult population are quite significant. If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, India, China, uh, but even in our own country, roughly 42 million 10 to 19 year olds, uh, I think that it's certainly a population that is uh, important. Um, I think what this slide is also depicting, and you can see on the last uh, sort of box at the far right of the screen, that about 90% of the world's adolescents live in low and middle income countries. I think what's also true and should be of concern for us all is that about 90% of what we know about adolescence is actually from developed countries. And so there is a lot of scientific space in terms of adolescents and young adults that we actually should be conducting studies to try to figure out does context matter? I would argue that it does. And does the sort of extant literature on adolescence that primarily comes from the developed world, is that really uh, relevant for young people across the globe? Um, you can see here, I've sort of mentioned this already, that our country has roughly 42 million, about 13% of uh, the population. And I think the color coding, you can sort of see that it's providing a sense that young people are actually all over the country, and we would expect that. Uh, you can see from 2019 to 2050 that uh, we expect to have a, kind of a changing face of adolescence. And so in 2019, you can see that 54% roughly are white. Uh, you can see the remaining are Hispanic, Black, Asian, and other. But as we approach 2050, there's a shifting. And no surprise, increasingly the country, uh, particularly as it relates to 10 to 19-year-olds, will be more and more diverse. And you can see in the lower right-hand side of the slide, in 2050, nearly two in three adolescents in the U.S. will be racial, ethnic, uh, minorities. And so I think that's very, very important. And in fact, uh, will be the majority in terms of the adolescent population. So why do I care so much about adolescents? And why do I think that they matter so much for all of us, irrespective of whether or not our interests are uh, focused on adolescents? Well, this is a paper that appeared some time ago in 2016. It was in a special series uh, that was entitled the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing. And there's actually four points that I've added to the figure. The figure is what you see in the middle. What's numbered is actually uh, how I have organized it and the meaning that I've provided in terms of how it relates to my, my own work. And so one, I think adolescents tend to be largely uh, somewhat, I would say, overlooked in terms of uh, as an important population. And, and probably because if we think about young people, 
it's usually a time for the vast majority of adolescents that there's optimal health. And so never at any other point in our lives will we be as healthy as the majority of adolescents. I mean, that's a time in our life when things are pretty much going well for the vast majority of adolescents. And I think what the focus has really been is that there are some particular adolescent problems and risk that have tended to dominate the literature. And so typically folks think of things like you know, sexual behavior or smoking or drug use or mental health. And those are things that uh, are true. Many adolescents um, do well and don't experience negative outcomes, actually the vast majority. But it's also true that if we think about some of the challenges that young people face, uh, there are some things that have been uh, appropriately the attention of our scientific uh, sort of inquiry and our development of interventions. If you look uh, at bullet point number two, or Roman numeral number two, I think this is one of the things that I so value in terms of adolescence. It's actually quite amazing. You know, in many um, contexts and for a large number of young people, they may be experiencing uh, what is being labeled here as early life disadvantage. And so these are things that happen uh, during childhood that are, are difficult, that may be um, sort of inequities in our social or health or contextual inequities that make the primary task of growing up and reaching adulthood more challenging. What's beautiful about adolescence is that this second decade of life is a time that there is a real opportunity for corrective action. And that's not to say that we don't change throughout the course of our life. You know, I'm 51 years of age and I'm still changing. And I hope that some of the things that I've done in my past that may not necessarily be the best health behaviors or, uh, you know, things that uh, are continuously kind of areas that I'm working on that I will be able as I continue to grow and mature to change. But never has there been a more opportune moment as the second decade of life between 10 and 20 to actually undo, correct, intervene in the cumulative early life disadvantages in that first decade of life. And that's a very important point that I actually think is uh, one reason why I do so much work with adolescents. Another uh, important area is that um, too often we intervene with morbidity and mortality, uh, but particularly morbidity in adult years when people have developed uh, the kinds of conditions that, you know, sort of are very prevalent in our country. And so we think about obesity or hypertension or diabetes or hyperlipidemia, all the things that uh, we're intervening with later on in life. What often gets missed is that the onset and the initial trajectory, the developmental pathway from when folks start adopting the exposure or engaging in uh, the behaviors that then later in life make it that they sort of have those conditions, oftentimes they have their origins in adolescence. And I think something that was very pronounced in this paper in the Lancet Commission is that 70% of premature, 70% of premature mortality in adults actually has its origins in adolescence. And that's a point that I often think gets missed because adolescents, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, tend to be healthy. So they're not the focus of a lot of our interventions. When in fact, if we're trying to uh, reduce some of the disparities that we see in adults, we probably should be thinking about adolescents as an important opportunity for setting the trajectory in the right direction. It's not just about health. There's also an economic and social impact. And what I mean here is that when young people are disengaged, and when they're not able to reach their full potentials as adults, and that, that is the primary task of adolescents, growing up and becoming a healthy uh, adult and being able to contribute to society broadly, then there are some real missed opportunities. One, we're not able to benefit from all of the economic and social gains that our society would make from having healthy, sort of optimal adults. Uh, but we also have a population of individuals who, because of some of the morbidity and some of the cumulative disadvantage that has gone unaddressed, tend to be more reliant on health and social welfare services as adults. And so again, there's a huge economic argument 
the Y adolescents uh, are sort of a really important population for us to target. So yes, adolescents do have problems during uh, that second decade of life that warn our attention. Yes, there's an opportunity to correct early life disadvantage, uh, and that particularly that first 10 years, a lot of the mortality that we see that is premature in adults and morbidity has its origins in adolescence, and there's an economic and a social argument. For those four reasons, I think that adolescence is a very important population and that it should be a greater focus of attention. I'm not going to talk too much about the next couple of slides because I've taken some time on that one to kind of lay uh, the foundation of what comes next. And I think that you can see here the point reinforced that 70% of the mortality is really rooted uh, in adults, is, is the premature mortality is rooted in adolescence. And you can see on the right that that sort of the first use of alcohol, uh, initiation of substance uh, use, tobacco, the first onset of a major mental health disorder, our dietary choices, our physical activity, uh, you know, sexual debut and sexual risk, a lot of those things have their origins in adolescence and then set the course of uh, for many things that come later. You can see here the social and economic uh, sort of argument that I was making. So 16 to 24 year olds, they're roughly uh, 4.1 million uh, 16 to 24 year olds that are not in school and don't have a job and they account for roughly 55 billion in foregone tax and they also represent a significant uh, sort of social and health expenditure because of their being much more likely to be in poverty, much more likely to not complete school. They may be disconnected, living apart from their families, which provide a natural buffer for their health and well being. And they may be underinsured or uninsured. And so, again, this is another way of saying that when adolescents don't do well, it's not just during the course of their adolescent uh, sort of years but their implications long-term that impact not only the population that is disconnected, but all of us, but all of us. I mean, it's really true that young people who don't grow up to be, uh, reach their full potential, that it has implications for our society and for our country as a whole. So now I'm gonna to transition to the second point, which is really about uh, sexual and reproductive health. And I think that much of these data actually are uh, probably well known to this group. Uh, despite uh, a lot of the concern in our country in the past regarding unplanned uh, pregnancies and births, the truth is that over uh, the last couple of decades, we've actually done uh, much better. We're at the lowest point ever in terms of births and pregnancies that are unplanned among adolescents uh, in the age that you see here, 15 to 19. There's been a steady decline. I think what's also important is that despite the overall progress, there are still some places where we're seeing an inequity or a disparity. And I would argue that for Native American youth, for African American youth, for Latino, Hispanic youth, for youth that are involved in uh, sort of public institutions, for example, transitioning from the criminal justice system or involved in the child welfare system, we see elevated rates of both uh, you know, pregnancy and birth. I would also argue a significant number of uh, pregnancies and, and births, I should say, births in a given year are actually secondary uh, pregnancies. The young person has already had uh, a primary pregnancy, and yet that often gets overlooked in the data that is presented. And I would say that we should be very careful because we have made progress for a number of years, but I think that we've had some challenges, particularly of late, where our focus has been out of necessity responding to a global pandemic. And I guess it's raising questions for me as I look across a number of areas, what has that meant for uh, historical disparities, groups that have uh, improved, but haven't improved in the same way that the overall rates have improved but even more importantly, is there any risk for us to have uh, some backward movement because we've been so distressed and preoccupied with, out of necessity, with COVID? I also will say that STIs, which has of late in the last, I don't know, five to 10 years have uh, really been uh, of great interest to me. Uh, and so I'm thinking here beyond HIV, but really reportable STIs, um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and others, 
you know, STIs have reached uh, their record high in 2019. So again, the highest point ever, and it's the sixth year in a row that we're seeing increases. This has been in many ways what others uh, coined a hidden epidemic years ago with the initial National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine report on the hidden epidemic. It still remains largely hidden. And I think if you look on the right, uh, you can see here youth ages 10 to 24, that they roughly account for 56% of the reported STI cases in 2019. So about a half, a little more than half, of all the reported STIs in a given year are among young people ages 10 to 24. That should be of great alarm because if we think about the overall uh, sort of proportion of people who are sexually active, and let's say all of those people were represented by four, uh, and so these four fingers that I'm holding up represent all the people in our country that are sexually active. Only one of them would be in the age of 10 to 24, and yet half, more than half, of all the reported STIs in a given year are among that one person relative to the other three. And you can see here that minority or ethnic and racial minorities account for one and two of the new STIs. And the same comments that I made previously about other populations, whether they be sexual minority youth, uh, whether they be youth in public systems, uh, criminal justice, child welfare, et cetera. Uh, again, greater, greater uh, burden of, of STIs. I think that uh, around young people at risk and living with HIV, you can see here that 20% of new HIV diagnoses occur in this group of 13 to 24. I think that the most recent data is showing some progress in terms of uh, incident cases in this age group, but we're seeing that diagnoses are increasing. I think this data has been, it's been troublesome for me in the sort of 24 and up in that sort of late, uh, you know, sort of young adulthood moving closer to, uh, you know, sort of that 24 to 30 range. We're seeing significant increases and Latino and Black youth account for roughly four and five of the new HIV diagnoses in this particular, uh, you know, sort of adolescent and adult uh, population. And I think it's worth saying that young MSM in particular uh, carry the vast uh, overall uh, burden of, of, of HIV. And so again, another area of great concern. We have a national strategy on December 1st. My understanding is that the U.S. will be issuing a new national strategy, a revised one. And I think that uh, the pillars of this strategy have been designed, as many know, to really think through how we can end the HIV epidemic in our country. For the purposes of today, I'm trying to argue that in terms of pregnancies, births, sexually transmitted infections, and HIV, that young people are an important population and that we need to keep an eye on the disparities that are uh, sort of very much pronounced among young people. In our country, because of the disparities that uh, I've just talked about, there have been a number of dominant approaches. And so uh, I work as a nurse, uh, as a nurse practitioner. I'm still involved in clinical care of young people. And so happy to say that oftentimes there uh, are clinic-based uh, opportunities where a young person may come in uh, upon uh, being exam examined or through a sexual history or there's something that is being picked up uh, in you know sort of routine screening that suggests that the young person is sexually active. Uh, and so one way that we've responded to the disparities is through clinic-based approaches. Oftentimes there are community-based efforts where there are interventions that are happening in the community. Increasingly there's social media and there's public service announcements. Uh, there also have been things that have been environmental like placing condoms uh, in places where young people can access them without necessarily having an adult uh, be the gatekeeper. And then for a long time, we've had school-based uh, curricula and, and sort of uh, comprehensive sex education in schools or some kind of sex education, if it in fact is offered, that uh, have been the basic tools that we've used as a country to address adolescent sexual and reproductive health. What's being depicted here, these are all terrific things, and I don't in any way want to suggest that we shouldn't focus on these things. These all have an important role and uh, and they're, they should continue. I think what I am going to argue is that they all focus on the adolescent directly. 
And I think what's different is that adolescence exists in a broader context. And one of the most important contexts is actually the familial context. And so why does that matter so much? That matters so much because uh, young people have said time and time again that when it comes to important decisions in their life, including sexual and reproductive health, that their parents play an important role. There are also some other advantages uh, that actually are quite important that are different than uh, some of the dominant approaches that we've adopted as a country. So one, uh, family-based approaches really recognize not only the special bond that a parent has with their adolescent child, but it really places the parents in a position of being the experts. And so I wanna spend just a second on this because I think it's worth covering. Uh, one, parent, uh, in my view, is not necessarily only the biological parent. It's the adult primary caregiver, the person who is in the parental role for that adolescent. Two, when I think about uh, being an expert, it's not necessarily that the parent is the expert on sexual and reproductive health. That's not what I'm conveying. Oftentimes, uh, many of us, uh, if we've not been formally trained, we may have significant knowledge gaps in what we know about sexual and reproductive health. But parents are the experts on their adolescent children. They know, the vast majority of parents know their adolescent children and have insights and influence that is distinct from some of the other mechanisms that we've relied on in terms of being able to reach young people. Information can be tailored. I think a lot of the times when we think about delivering interventions to young people, we have sometimes relied on a one size fits all. Parents can tailor information. Adolescents want their parents to be involved and parents actually want support and uh, are motivated to keep their adolescent children healthy and safe. Timing can be ongoing and flexible. It's not a one a size all fits delivery, nor is it a one time delivery. The kinds of things that we do with families actually have the potential for being enacted or implemented over time. Parents do have the job of being the primary socializing agent for the young uh, person. And again, there's a lot of sort of difference in our country around uh, values and around perspectives. And I think what's great about putting families and parents in particular at the center of that is that the interventions can take into account the value uh, the culture and the values of the family as it gets delivered. And I think I've made that point in the final uh, sort of uh, point that's on the slide around cultural and religious beliefs. You can see here from what previously was the national campaign to prevent teen pregnancy, now the power to decide that for young people, it is 12 to 15 and also for 16 to 19, that parents are identified as being uh, incredibly important in terms of major decisions including for sexual and reproductive health. There's been a ton of scientific literature that supports this. This is not all literature, there's a lot more. I've taken liberty to uh, just uh, populate it with many of my own studies, but also studies that uh, have been more contemporary, And um, but I could add a lot more to this. There are certainly many more people than what's on the right-hand side. I think what's nice about this is that research has supported the important role of parents in delaying sexual debut, in condom use, in frequency of sex, in vaccine uptake, in HIV testing, and also improved treatment outcomes for young people living with HIV. Uh, a lot of literature focuses on two domains, structure and process. I think that for my purposes, I certainly look at both uh, structure and process, but I've tended to focus more on process and in particular communication and how parents can communicate what they say, when they say it, how they say it, under what circumstances. Monitoring and supervision, are there specific uh, parenting strategies that parents can invoke that actually are related to the outcome of interest? Um, how young people and parents feel about their relationship with their parent and then role modeling, what parents are, are, are modeling. There's been less attention to process, more focus on structure, although there's been significant development in terms of, of process in the last 10 or, or, or so years. Uh, I'm gonna talk about development of efficacious uh, family-based interventions. So often folks will contact me and they'll say, Vincent, we're working on this parenting program. What do you think about it? And I typically will say, it sounds great. There are four things that I typically uh, uh, sort of use as my lens for thinking through 
whether or not I believe the intervention will be efficacious. And you can see those four things on the slide. And so first, I have questions about how they developed the intervention. And so it has to do with the formative phase. How did they identify the target behavior? And what are they specifically targeting in terms of their parenting approach? Also, uh, have they explored what is the best way of reaching the parents and issues of implementation and delivery of the intervention? Have they optimized? Do they have a strong theory of parental influence, of adolescent sexual uh, behavior or whatever the outcome is? And have they linked parental influence to their theory of adolescent uh, sexual behavior or again, whatever the outcome is? Um, how do they evaluate the intervention? And are they able to not only identify whether or not it's efficacious, but the explanatory mechanisms, which I think is very important. And can we explain how it is that the intervention is enacting its influence on the outcome? And then I think that beyond uh, whether or not we have an efficacious intervention, and I think uh, in this case, let's assume that we do have an efficacious intervention, how do we then think about broad uptake of the intervention? And how do we uh, ensure active dissemination. So I'm going to talk about each of these and I'll try to go fairly quickly because I, I realize we've got about about 10 to 15 minutes left and then I'd like to open it up for questions. And so I'm going to just pick up the pace a little bit because of where I am in my presentation. So the first is when I think about identifying a target behavior, I do probably much of what others uh, are doing. Uh, I usually will conduct an extensive literature review. I look for gaps. I evaluate the state of the science and I identify basic patterns of things that are clear, not so clear, and things that are absolutely unknown. I often will look at secondary data and data that uh, is available. And so I've tended to use nationally representative data where I'll look at relational forms, I'll sort of estimate effects, and start to compare what I'm learning from the secondary analyses to my literature review. And then I also typically will conduct some qualitative work, uh, usually with parents, uh, with adolescents, and then also with other key informants to understand what I'm picking up from the literature review and also the secondary analyses. I continue that in terms of issues regarding delivery and implementation. I'm specifically trying to explore issues of feasibility uh, is it acceptable? Is it culturally appropriate? Are there specific settings where I'm most likely to reach the parents? Are there certain preferences that the families have? Are those preferences consistent across the adolescents and the parents? I start to build through elicitation studies the case for my measures and whether or not I'm measuring uh, sort of the right things. And often in that formative research, I'm also uh, refining my data collection methods. Uh, one of the big challenges that we have in family-based research is actually recruiting the families. And I think that I've been reasonably successful in being able to recruit families because I've spent time trying to understand what are the best approaches for recruiting them. And then I look at barriers and facilitators to in implementing the intervention. These things are all done what you see on the right-hand side. Uh, qualitative interviews, focus groups, the elicitation studies, and then also some psychometric evaluation of measures that are developed from the formative work uh, that precedes and whether or not they're actually uh, measuring what's most salient. I combine that in this third step with really having a strong theory of adolescent decision making. And so for the purposes of today, Let's say that I'm interested in sexual risk behavior, then I want to understand as part of my formative work, well, how can I model how young people make decisions about a given sexual uh, behavior? And so it may be sexual debut, it may be correct condom use, it may be consistent condom use, it may be the uptake of a vaccine. Very precise formative research, looking at clear proximal determinants and using a theory of decision making uh, to better understand uh, what do I need to focus in on. At the same time, I'm evolving theories of parental influence and what really matters, the level of the parent, moving beyond global constructs. If I'm interested in condom use, well, what is the specific communication that should be occurring around condoms? Uh, are there specific monitoring and appropriate ways in which parents can be involved around the condom behavior. And that may be different if I'm talking about HPV vaccine 
or right now the work that I'm doing on COVID vaccination and mitigation of COVID risk in families, what they're talking about, the appropriate ways in which parents are involved, what they're role modeling, those things vary. And in my formative work, I'm getting really clear on what are the relevant constructs and potential opportunities for leveraging the intervention. I also uh, need a linkage function, so I try to specifically understand how does the parental influence shape the decision and can I model changes at the parent level to outcomes at the adolescent level. This is not a small point. I just want to emphasize that oftentimes uh, there are really great interventions that haven't thought through carefully how do parents really shape uh, variables that are important to the adolescent. And, uh, and I would argue that it's important to get the adolescent's perception because often parents are indicating that they're doing these things, which they are. It doesn't mean that the adolescent is perceiving that. And so again, quite a bit of work early on in our formative work to understand those linkages. And then this sort of uh, bluish circle, the context, how is all of this operating in certain contexts? And does the context of the Bronx versus North Carolina, India, the Caribbean, these are places where we've done studies. Does the context matter for these basic relational forms? And if so, in what way do we need to adjust our intervention in order to achieve the desired effect? So I won't uh, talk too much about this. I'll simply say that I've published papers. And if you look at uh, sort of my body of research and the work of others, you'll see that uh, the papers generally fall into these categories. Uh, they fall into either their theories around how adolescents make decisions about parental influence or they're about the linkage function. And I kind of have those three piles of work that uh, I'm typically sort of focused on. Um, and so uh, I think here often in the fourth step of high development interventions, I usually am doing some sort of quantitative exploration of the base rates of the behaviors that I'm targeting. Are they prevalent in the community that I'm targeting? And then is there a developmental trajectory that allows me to sort of really ensure that I'm focusing at the right developmental period to prevent or to reduce? And so I can see that by looking over time, even if it's a cross-sectional study, if I have different age adolescents, I can see how are things changing? And is there an optimal period where parents are going to be most likely to be uh, effective and for what behavior. I think I've talked a little bit about targeting both the predictors of adolescent and parent behaviors. Uh, it's very important at this phase, step four, to get estimates of the weight or the importance of the relative, uh, the, the importance of the predictors and which ones are of greatest importance. And so if I'm trying to lose weight and I have a salad, I have a piece of chicken and I have brownies, well, certainly the brownies are going to be the thing that are probably contributing the most to my weight gain or loss. And so I want to really figure out what, where is there the most importance in terms of the things to target? Are the uh, things that are most important, the brownies, are they, do they vary by important demographic factors, gender, ethnicity, age, or wh whatever segmentation variable that I'm interested in understanding? And, uh, and then again, is that linkage function from the parents at the adolescent, is it operating? These are things that I typically am doing. And so you can see here what's being depicted is that I'll have a specific target behavior at the adolescent level. I have predictors that I'm trying to understand. And so I'm modeling each of those arrows that show direct relational form. I'm also looking at uh, a parent behavior. So perhaps the parent behavior is communication about condoms. What kinds of things are predicting the condom communication, and how does that communication in turn affect adolescent predictors, and does it have a direct influence uh, that is not uh, sort of mediated by these adolescent level predictors, but is operating independently? So I model all of this in my formative work to get an understanding of where am I going to find the greatest value in what I should concentrate on. And so when I'm doing training for my interventionist or we're going through fidelity, we're really emphasizing certain key components. So it's not just the intervention, families talking together, or whatever the intervention may be. There's specific content that we know is the secret sauce of what makes it work. And it's based on these quantitative assessments of both the adolescent and the parent level. 
Um, a lot of what we do in our fifth step is that we evaluate the efficacy of the intervention. I think what we're doing here is that we are simultaneously exploring issues of implementation, barriers to recruitment, fidelity, uh, delivery, but we're also trying to understand if what we've optimized from our formative work in terms of the RCT that we're conducting in the actual trial, uh, is that actually having the desired effect? And if so, then what is the explanatory pathway so that it's not just that we end up with a difference in uh, you know, the experimental condition relative to some control condition, but can we explain that? Or if we don't get a change between the, the two arms, uh, then are we able to see that the mediators didn't change and they didn't change enough or what happened? And we typically are trying to understand that. And that's what this figure is expressing, that we may have a positive effect, uh, a negative effect or no effect. And so what I'm typically trying to understand is whether or not the mediators changed in the direction that I want them to. And if they did, what was the effect of that? And I, I think that's actually quite important. It's, it's something that I do fairly regularly. I spend a lot of time on these explanatory factors and really being able to understand the mechanics of how my intervention is working. In terms of broad uptake, I think what's here is this notion that we need to move beyond uh, designing things that actually only work in the randomized clinical trial. We've got to make sure that we're increasing the chances that it will be picked up by the folks who are trying to actually, uh, you know, shape or benefit or, you know, our, our primary purpose. So the endpoint, the endpoint matters. And so these are four things that I would argue that we need to be practical, feasible, it has to be sustainable, and we need to be able to develop it in a form that it can be disseminated broadly. Uh, I think that our dissemination should not just be in scientific uh, publications. Obviously, we all do that. I continue to do that. I think it's important. And in conference presentations, but increasingly, particularly as I've been much more committed to uh, really having real world impact, I've been uh, more and more uh, engaged in dissemination that involves what I would consider non-traditional partners. And so really reaching out to healthcare providers, nurses, doctors, other kinds of healthcare providers, key decision makers. And so a lot of work and a lot of time is spent with national organizations and also elected officials and governmental organizations that can help to take the advances that are being uh, sort of identified in our science and, and they can really reach the, the, the real world. And then obviously through very targeted communication. So taking what's scientific and translating that into opinion pieces, uh, other forms of, of everyday language that any parent can pick up and read and understand uh, what the, the basic message is for, you know, implementing that science in a way that's practical and straightforward. So very quickly, FTT is an applied example. I'm going to go another three or four minutes and then I'll stop and open it up for questions. So these are a number of studies that I've conducted over the past um, 20 years with FTT and what you can see here, different populations, different settings. Um, and I would say most recently uh, we've conducted, beside the trial that we're doing now, that's a digital trial, which is still in the field. We've done a clinic-based evaluation that we published in 2020 in pediatrics that had 900 parent adolescent diets. It focused on condom use and sexual debut. It was uh, part of a clinic. It was what we call a triadic intervention. It involved a healthcare provider, a parent and an adolescent, and I'm going to talk about that very briefly. So FTT, the clinic version, is the last one that was highlighted on the previous slide, is what I'm actually uh, going to use as the referent. Um, so it's a parent-based intervention that's designed to uh, really delay sexual debut, reduce frequency of sex, and for the clinic trial, it involved uh, condom use. And you can see here that in our formative work, we actually saw that parents really trusted their healthcare provider. Uh, adolescents uh, really wanted guidance from their parent. And so this was a natural uh, partnership. And so we implemented FTT clinic as really a partnership between the provider, the parent, and the adolescent. It tends to focus on the disparity, where the disparities are greatest in the Bronx where it was implemented. It was Latino and Black adolescents. 
and, and I've already mentioned uh, the outcomes. The components were a face-to-face -face session that occurred in the clinic. Providers were too busy to actually do the session, so we uh, identified in our formative research that we called it a provider extender. It was somebody from the intervention team that was placed in the clinic that actually could take advantage of the time when the adolescent was being examined to work with the parent and to deliver the material. There's a workbook uh, that goes to the family and there's a session that occurred while the parent is at the clinic uh, that actually the parent is instructed on how to use the materials. The provider does have a role the provider endorses the program and shares with the parent and the adolescent that it's really critical that they work on the materials that the parent was presented. And then there's a follow-up call that is a booster call that just checks in with the parent and sees how things are going. So um, a number of things actually uh, happened in terms of outcomes. I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time, and I'm going to sort of get to uh, kind of the main, the main points. You can see here a little bit of what was sort of the overall design of the study. Roughly 900 uh, mother adolescent dyads were randomized uh, to a four to one ratio. And you can see uh, that uh, there were 600 that were allocated uh, to the intervention arm and 300, so actually I should say two to one ratio. That's actually a mistake there, my, my apologies. A two to one ratio, 600 to the experimental arm and 300 to the control arm. And you can see what was included in the overall analysis, what the uh, overall attrition was under 10%, and there was no differential attrition between the arms. The conditions were comparable at the baseline, and you can see in terms of outcomes that we were able to decrease sexual behavior in the experimental arm relative to uh, the control arm. You can see that condom use was higher, and then some parent outcomes in terms of communication and also supervision and monitoring, the experimental arm was higher relative to the control arm. So things were working in the way that we thought they would work. Lots of lessons learned. I think for this study, uh, you know, we were able to identify an effect and then also what the mediators or the explanatory factors were. Uh, we were able to implement our intervention without disrupting the clinic, uh, which was very, very important. Um, and so, again, um, just thinking through many of those issues that I've highlighted in the first part of my presentation, which were about formative content. FTT has been um, widely disseminated across the country. It is on a list of evidence-based uh, teen pregnancy prevention programs. And we continue to work with FTT. We're actually doing a trial now that is a digital version of FTT that we're currently evaluating. We have expanded our work with uh, mothers to fathers. And a couple of years ago, we were actually in the New York Times because we were focused on the development of uh, father-based interventions that were focused on how fathers could talk to their adolescent sons about, uh, about sex and some of the issues that young men uh, are facing. Uh, final thoughts, just to wrap up, uh, it's the year of the nurse. It would be uh, remiss of me not to mention nurses. Nurses are the largest segment of the public health workforce that often gets overlooked or sort of underappreciated. More than 4 million uh, nurses in the country. And you can see here that the WHO is that there is no global health agenda if there's not a sustained effort in really thinking about contributions uh, made by nurses. Uh, I am not going to say too much about this slide other than saying that a couple of years ago, a number of us uh, published a paper that was focused on what is it that nurses uh, contribute uniquely, and you can check that out. It's in uh, the um, American Journal of Nursing, and it was published, uh, I forget, but it was a couple of years ago. Uh, this is actually very important, the NASM report on sexually transmitted infections. I was one of the folks who worked on the report, and I think there's a lot of terrific information. It's a follow-up to the hidden epidemic, and it really raises concern about the problem in our country, and then also there's a ton of information about strategies and things that we can do. And then a number of articles that have been published that are, really reflect uh, some of the work that uh, comes from the report that have been shorter pieces that actually highlight uh, what's there. I'm going to stop. I feel like I rushed through that last part, but I want to make sure I leave time for questions. Thank everyone and say in advance that feel free to reach out. And my apologies for rushing through that last part. 
I hope we'll have time for some questions. And so thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Guillermo Ramos for that presentation with lots of much needed information. And for the brief moment that we have left, left about 10 minutes or so, we'll switch to the question and answering section. So the participants, if you can just remain mute while other people are talking, that will be great. Feel free to enter your questions in the chat and I can read those out. You can also use the um, raise your hand feature to ask a question. So, Christina, while we're waiting for a question, I just want to acknowledge that I see that Eva Lefkowitz is on the call. And Eva Lefkowitz is sort of an icon in this area of family-based approaches. Uh, one of my colleagues, Laura Romo, was Eva's student. And Laura Romo is someone who I met years ago at the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. And when I was in my formative years, we were reading papers uh, by Eva Lefkowitz. And so just want to kind of flag that. Thank you for sharing that. Eva has agreed to be one of my research mentors in a project that I am currently building regarding um, youth in foster care and their sexual reproductive health promotion and the role of caregivers in helping them to meet those needs. And Eva said thank you and she enjoyed reading your work as well. Thank you. I have a quick one. question. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Christina. Um, I just wanted to jump in with a quick question. One of the things you said just kind of resonated with me because this isn't my research area. I'm in the weight management field, but fathers are often the forgotten parent in weight management. And, you know, a lot of the work focuses on moms. And we had a colleague here who has since left, but her focus was on, on fathers and the role that they can play in establishing healthy habits. Um, you mentioned some of your work with fathers and um, sexual health behaviors. And I'm just wondering, um, it sounds like families were receptive to the father playing a larger role in some of those conversations. Is that the take home there? Yeah, so I guess what I would say is that you're absolutely correct. I think that was Amy who was speaking, um, that fathers have been neglected in terms of the literature on uh, some of those processes. I think historically, fathers had been have been sort of framed as being disciplinarian or sort of uh, economic support. And I think that's troublesome for a number of reasons, because particularly in the communities where I'm working, if dad is underemployed or unemployed, then he gets framed quickly as being a deadbeat dad. And I think fathers can contribute much more than just, uh, you know, economics or discipline. I think that there is uh, sort of a growing literature, but it's actually quite developed. And we know that both mothers and fathers uniquely contribute to important outcomes in young people. And yes, we are uh, working on something called Fathers Raising Responsible Men, and it is an intervention that uh, is not FTT, but it adopts similar principles where we go through the same basic arguments. How do we reach fathers? What are the relevant ways in which they can be involved in terms of processes? And that we're evaluating the effects of that intervention on adolescent boys' uh, sort of use of sexual and reproductive health services and condom behavior. There's a question in the chat from Kim. And Kim says, I really like the phases of intervention research that you laid out. Have you published this? If so, could you share a reference or references um, I would like to share with my students? So, you know, I haven't, Kim. I, I should probably do that. And I think that I could say a lot more. I did an abbreviated version, but I really do uh, sort of use a formula and over time, I, it's helped me in terms of my research program to follow those steps and to kind of know where I am. I think in the first 10 years of my career, I didn't always know where I was. And then I realized that I was sort of adopting a series of steps. And those steps helped me to really make sense and to train others. You know, I was fortunate. My uh, primary mentor uh, was an amazing and is an amazing researcher, uh, James Jackard, commonly referred to as Jim Jackard who really was, along with Eva and others, sort of at the forefront of this when, when parenting was, people didn't think that parents really had a role in sexual reproductive health. And he was the person who trained me to think this way. And I've sort of evolved that over the years, uh, adding my own unique flavor. But 
but you know, it sounds like it's probably a good a good uh, product for me to take on uh, in my in my free time. And Kim says she's seen the Orbit, the ORBI T model, and what shall I call yours at the intervention optimization piece. Yes. I mean, Linda Collins, who does a lot with most and sort of optimization of intervention, she was at NYU and I saw Linda some years ago at an NIH uh, seminar and she really helped me to also think about what I had been doing, but also the sort of three phases in her work and how she organizes interventions. And so I won't say that my work is most, but those principles of really trying to figure out how to make sure I have the right components and that they're optimized and then evaluating that, that, that has been something that I actually strongly agree with. And there's a question from Danielle. Does any literature stand out to you in incorporating the faith-based communities in interventions in terms of influencing parents' perspective on adolescent sexual and reproductive health? I think there is increasingly a growing body of literature about religiosity and, uh, you know, in particular, and how that relates to a range of decisions and outcomes among young people. And I think that there is literature that has taken the setting of churches or other places of worship and how does that become an opportunity for potentially reaching families and young people in particular. And I think that it is an important context uh, where if we can get more precision on what are the specific mechanisms by which the influence is enacted, I think the same principles apply. And so in the table that I have in my slides, I talk about school-based settings or clinic-based settings or community settings. And that was sort of that circle that was around those three pieces of the theory of how we develop efficacious interventions. The faith-based community in particular, uh, whether it be a church or some other kind of institution, it's an, it's an important setting for thinking through how does it relate to those mechanisms and how can we optimize the effects given that setting. Thank you. Any other questions? One question I can ask in the meantime is you talked about you spent some time trying to evaluate the challenges with recruiting um, this population for your study in the past and you spent so much time on that. For research involving foster parents, for instance, who work with children who are involved in foster care, do you have any suggestion on strategies and how you can target that population? Because there's so much um, stigma associated with caregivers in foster care and how do you approach them for research without making them feel like they're just being evaluated or assessed? Great question, Christina. So I have three uh, brief ways of answering that. So the first I would say is that uh, I think that too often we only hear about the successes, and I'm guilty of that today because I have spoken about the success of FTT, but I have a different talk that's called Under the Hood, and Under the Hood uh, are, is a collection of things that went wrong when I was conducting community randomized clinical trials, and I love to give that talk because it's the reality of the challenges that we face, and it gives people a sense of the challenges, the barriers, and then what we did to address that. So I think that more of us should be talking about the under the hood, not just the outcome that we get that looks great, but there's a whole story that I think is uh, important to share as well. There's a lot of science there, and I think more of us would benefit if we did that. The second thing is I would say that in terms of uh, best ways to reach families, I have done a lot of work uh, using area sampling methods. I go to their homes. I am literally recruiting door to door and my teams have been, I've typically worked in urban areas where there's high density. And so think of public housing. So I'm going door to door and recruiting families. And I do that for a number of reasons. One, because I wanna get uh, sort of a generalizable sample that is representative of the community and not just people who are showing up in whatever the institution is. And also uh, I love being able to have um, a certain amount of homogeneity in the samples that I'm recruiting. And, it, and 
it does help me for a number of reasons in terms of attrition and you know probably another talk as well why i'm doing that but i think the important thing christina is that i'm going into settings where there is a high probability that i'm going to be able to reach people there's a lot of people and uh and i'm thinking through how i can be uh, trustworthy and this is very nuanced i'm not focused on uh, whether or not the community trusts uh, me, uh, because then what happens is they become other and they then become the community that is, we need to do something to get them to trust us. I don't adopt that approach. The approach that I adopt is what am I doing to be trustworthy? What is my team doing to be trustworthy? And how are we showing up in community as a trustworthy team, trustworthy research, trustworthy project, and then how do we uh, then, so how does that relate then to people's decisions to uh, become involved? And I could say a lot about that, what that means and the steps for doing that. I think in a nutshell, uh, being trustworthy in my experience has resulted in much higher participation rates and it's much more uh, beneficial than focusing on how do I get the participants to trust me. Thank you so much for that. I will definitely take a read of Under the Hood. Thank you. So we are at the end of our time and I would just like to thank you again so much for that presentation. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.